Hello everyone, this is Keith here, and today I'm reviewing Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, or KOTOR 2 for short. KOTOR 2 was originally released for the Xbox way back in 2004, and then for Microsoft Windows in 2005. My first experience playing KOTOR 2 was on an original Xbox way back in the day. I remember it being one of my favorite games at the time. So when I heard about the 2015 re-release of KOTOR 2, which added tons of new features including native Linux support, I just had to revisit the game and see if it still holds up. After purchasing the game, the first thing I did was browse the Steam Workshop page for KOTOR 2, where I downloaded the Restored Content mod. Evidently, Obsidian, the developers of KOTOR 2, removed a fair bit of content from the game in order to meet a deadline. After selecting New Game from the main menu, we're immediately taken into the Character Generation screen, where we create our own character. You first choose the class of your character, Counselor, Senator, or Guardian. Each class has its own strengths, and it's best to pick whichever class suits your playstyle. I'm disappointed that you're only given a choice of human races, but I guess that's just me being nitpicky. In the next screen, you can choose to further customize your character or allow the game to handle it for you by selecting the Quick Character button. Choosing Custom Character brings us to the next screen where we select our portrait as well as distribute stats. Portrait selection is the only physical customization allowed and sadly you're limited to a selection of unalterable heads. Which kind of blows, but whatever. I went for the generic white guy with blonde hair and blue eyes because it's the same choice I made when I originally played the game back in the day. Examining the portrait further, I couldn't help but notice how silly he looks. I mean, look at those lips. And I didn't notice this until I was editing everything together, but look at his left eye. It's not even centered properly, poor guy. We then select our character's attributes, skills, feats, and then name our character. After a long debate with myself, I decided to name my character Saber Stabby. In retrospect, I regret not prefixing that name with Darth to make it sound more Star Wars-y. Once we're done with that, we can finally start the game! Ah, oh, damn it, never mind, looks like we gotta get fan service out of the way first. Once the opening text crawl is finished, and I would like to put extra emphasis on crawl, we find ourselves on board the Ebon Hawk, which totally isn't a ripoff of the Millennium Falcon, no, it's fine. The Ebon Hawk is damaged, and most of the crew is either unconscious or in critical condition. Uh, Stabby, you, you alright there, bud? This section of the game is the prologue, which you can choose to play through or skip entirely. This whole section acts as a tutorial, and in my opinion, you can skip this without missing much. After playing through the prologue, which I wish I really would have skipped, we find ourselves inside a cultal tank receiving medical treatment. Once we're free, we can finally walk around and explore! Uh, uh oh, what, what the hell? I'm stuck, I can't move, what the fuck? Yeah, there's a pretty nasty bug that can prevent you from being able to move. I did some googling around, and apparently this bug has existed for years, long before the 2015 re-release. This bug can be triggered whenever the player examines something, opens a container, or even after attacking. So basically performing almost any action can trigger the bug. I looked online and came across a fix that kinda works. Setting the in-game refresh rate to 60Hz and turning VSync on reduces the occurrences of the bug, but it still happens all the fucking time for me. Quick saving and loading that quick save will free you, but having to constantly save and load is really annoying. Okay, so that's something we'll just have to get used to. Let's go back to playing the game. Fairly soon into the game, we meet our first companion, Kreia. I find the companions in KOTOR 2 intriguing and, in my opinion, are the strongest aspect of the game. Throughout the game, you're given multiple opportunities to interact with your companions, giving you a chance to gain their influence. Gaining influence can unlock new dialogue options, which in turn can further reveal the backstory of a given character. Gaining influence can also unlock new abilities between you and that companion. Companions also react to the moral choices you make. Moral choices are pretty black and white, with the good and bad options being fairly obvious. For example, kill this person or don't. Help this person with a few errands to get an item you need, or use intimidation to get the item for free. Basic stuff like that, really. Later into the game, you do encounter more uh, situations where options are a bit more gray, but uh, sadly, these situations are the exception, not the norm. Your attributes also have an effect on the dialogue choices available to you. Having high points and awareness, as an example, can unlock different dialogue options. My favorite character would have to be HK47. And when I say favorite, I mean my favorite of any game. I absolutely love his writing. Answer. If 
by OK. You mean the loss of almost all my existing assassination protocols? Then no, I am not OK. Furthermore, I seem to have no discretionary control over my vocabulator, causing me to reveal my true function as an assassin droid of unrivaled sophistication. Recitation. Yes, as I said, I am an assassin droid. It is my primary function to burn holes through meat bags that you wish removed from the galaxy. Master, oh, how I hate that term. Christopher Tabori did a fantastic job, and I can't picture anyone else as the voice of the HK model robots. Hell, the character even won a ton of awards. Freya is an amazing character as well. Her writing and voice acting is nothing short of spectacular. But perhaps you will understand this, that perhaps it is important to me that you see me and my actions uncloaked. It is important that your judgments, whether be good or bad, stem from seeing me as I truly am. I did not ask you to trust me, only that you listen to what I have to tell you, but thank you. Props to Sarah Kestelman for her amazing voice acting. Greya has also won several awards from a variety of gaming journalism websites. Conversing is also primarily how the game's story is delivered. I don't want to dive too deep into the story, so I'll just give a brief synopsis. The game takes place 5 years after the first game and 4,000 years before the events of The Phantom Menace. The Sith have almost completely eradicated the Jedi, and it's up to you, a former Jedi exiled from the Jedi Order, to find the remaining survivors of the Jedi Order. Along the way, you regain your connection to the Force, and with the help of your companions, set out to stop the Sith. Okay, so that's enough of the story, let's talk about the gameplay. KOTOR 2 is a third-person RPG featuring possible real-time combat. KOTOR 2's combat system, like the previous game, is based on something called the D20 system, which is evidently something that was created for the D&D tabletop role-playing games. Now I personally don't know what the fuck a D20 is, so I just spam attack until everything is dead. Works for me. I just can't figure out what attack I should do at a given time. Should I use critical strike, flurry, or power attack? There's no combat log present on screen and the only information I'm given is the damage indicators that appear over the enemy's heads. I'm not told if damage is suppressed or if that attack wasn't particularly effective, just little text that pops up. After messing around in the menus, I did actually find a combat log, but it's hidden in the journal menu. First you have to open the journal menu with the J button, then select the messages log box and finally select the combat filter. Why do I have to do this? Why isn't there a little box on the screen for this sort of thing? Ah, fuck it, I'll just spam flurry. Spacebar pauses the game, which can be useful in combat for examining the situation and developing a strategy best suited for the current scenario. You can switch between party members by pressing the tab key or by selecting the character's portrait on the bottom right of the screen. Your companions will act on their own without your input, but sometimes the AI isn't exactly the best. There's a button on the bottom left bar where you can change the behavior of the current selected party member. It's a good idea to use this feature because the default aggressive setting will have your melee companions tank through mines at the first sight of an enemy. You can lob grenades, which is incredibly effective against clusters of enemies. And you know those mines I was talking about earlier? Well, if your demolition skill is high enough, you can actually retrieve these mines and put them to use. If your security skill is too low, you can blast a lock open with a mine. Although it should be noted that blasting containers open almost always results in breaking one of the items inside. This rule applies to bashing open containers as well. It's for this reason I recommend always carrying a security tunneler, which is really just a fancy name for a lockpick. Droid companions are pretty skilled in security, so they can be used to open locks as well. Going back to mines, you can plant them before enemy encounters or even during combat. I personally don't use mines much in combat, I just find it tedious planting them and trying to trick the AI to run into them. As you level up, you can choose to unlock force powers. Lightning, heal, choke, mind trick, all these and more can be unlocked upgraded and used in combat. Some force powers can even be used during dialogue. Mind Trick, for example, unlocks the Force Persuade option. My favorite ability is Force Speed, which you can cast in and outside of combat to greatly improve your character's movement speed. You also have usables for health recovery, temporary stat boosts, protective shields, etc. The game actually has a crafting system, albeit a fairly simplistic one. 
Throughout your travels, you come across chemicals and components. Chemicals can be used at lab stations to craft health items, stimulants, mines, and grenades, while components are used at workbenches for crafting upgrades, weapons, shields, security tunnels, computer spikes, parts, and repair kits. Repair kits are basically med kits for droids. Lab stations and workbenches allow you to break down items for chemicals and components, respectively. And of course, your ability to craft items depends on your medical and repair skills. Now, some of you may be asking, hey, how come I don't see any lightsabers? Well, that's because KOTOR 2 doesn't immediately give you a lightsaber. You have to earn it. Eventually, you'll come across someone named Beodur. After Beodur joins your crew aboard the Ebon Hawk, you can talk to him and he'll mention something about getting parts to construct a new lightsaber. You'll come across these parts as you naturally progress, but I find the quickest way to get these parts is on Dantooine. It takes a while to get a lightsaber, but man, when you do, <laughs> it's probably the biggest milestone in the game. No more vibro blades, no more clumsy blasters, it's lightsaber time. And man, does his lightsaber make you feel like a badass. Oh shit, did you see that jumping attack? Get fucking wrecked, my... The lightsaber can even be upgraded to make it even more badass. You also have lightsaber stances. You unlock new stances as you progress. Each stance offers advantages and disadvantages, and it's a good idea to pick the best one for the current situation. Have I mentioned the soundtrack yet? Mark Grisky composed the soundtrack, and it's amazing. The soundtrack is atmospheric, gloomy, and suits the environments well. So what's there left to talk about? Well, there's the minigames Pazak and Swoop Racing. Pazak is a card game that plays like blackjack, only you bust on 20 and you can use modifier cards to alter your score. In Swoop Racing, you have to reach the end of the track as fast as possible in an effort to beat the best time. You accelerate with the left mouse button and when the meter on the bottom reaches red, you let go of the left mouse button and quickly click again to gain more speed. I guess this is supposed to emulate the feeling of a manual transmission, but yeah, this isn't exactly Gran Turismo. Also, for some reason my aspect ratio is cropped in Swoop Racing, so I'm not sure why, but whatever. Really, the minigames aren't anything to write home about. Pazak can be fun due to its random nature, but Swoop Racing is too repetitive in my opinion. So yeah, I feel like that covers just about everything. In my opinion, KOTOR 2 still holds up incredibly well. Presentation is a little dated, but if you're someone who plays RPGs with a story and you're a fan of the Star Wars Extended Universe, then the KOTOR series is definitely worth playing. I recommend playing the first game before starting KOTOR 2 just so you can get a better understanding of the story. So yeah, that concludes my review. Thanks for watching, and until next time... May the Force be with you.